Well, today on Rethink Real Estate, we have Connor Steinbrook. Connor is a massive networker, um, but has a really curious story. Started off with online poker, doing incredibly well in that, and then growing to this incredibly famous person within the online poker world for it all to just crash and tumble and him go through quite an interesting process once everything dissolved. Connor dives into a little bit of that dark place that he was in and how he got himself out of it through self-paced learning and self-help. Uh, and then talks about the real estate side of things in the investing, growing into being a team lead at EXP and growing a 26 plus hundred, uh, 2600 plus network of agents. It's a fascinating conversation because Connor is somebody that is certainly set within trying to visualize your goals and getting there. But we talk about manifesting a little bit and how people can go down the wrong path with it also in this episode. Hopefully it's helpful, guys. It's a very intriguing story. And I thank Connor for giving us his time today. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Connor, welcome to Rethink Real Estate. What's going on, guys? How's everybody doing? <laughs> well, I think that um, I think you've kind of already rethought real estate a little bit, and we're going to dive into a little bit later on in the podcast around the factors of that. You know, uh, the the Wolf Pack did now. Did that name come from? I want to. I want to believe it came from the Hangover movie. I wish it. I wish I could say it did. <laughs> it came about. Uh, came about in a little bit of a unique way. I mean, for one. Uh, I went to Plano West High School in Dallas, Texas. It's a suburb north of Dallas. We were the Wolf Pack, so I played sports. And in sports, we had the mentality, we're going to run together as a family, as a pack, instead of a lone wolf. And uh, so that was part of it. Uh, some of the early adopter teams that were kind of taking market share in my company uh, when we started out had chosen other animal names. Don't want to kind of tell which ones and drive you guys that direction. <laughs> but um, I've realized that like I need to create a uh, comparable name to go up against the competition that we have. But let me pick a name of an animal that has the symbology behind a family unit in a, in a global uh, collective group nature, which is what wolf packs do is they run together as family. And also one that's a strong, proud animal that would be side by side standing up against our biggest competitors, what they're putting out there. And then um, just the nature in um, how, you know, uh, the intensity of how a wolf is in business, you know, you have to be relentless and, you know, all this characteristics of strength and honor and things like that kind of tied into it. And then the cool thing that's weird is uh, I didn't know this actually, like three and a half years later, I was on a, a leadership training call with one of my top leaders and I was talking to her and she goes, you know, that your name in uh, Irish means lover of wolves. So I looked it up on the internet. If you guys look it up, uh, Connor in Irish, I guess stands for lover of wolves. So it's kind of, it gave me the chills because uh, we had already built this organization globally and it was already off the ground. And somehow my name actually stands, uh, for, for lover of wolf. So it's kind of a multi-step process, but, um, ultimately a lot of it came from just like the team building nature or back when I was in team sports and kind of how, uh, that brand was a part of my past. No, that's cool. That's really cool. So here I am, you've got a full background to it, but I'm sort of that person thinking about that. There's somebody cheersing on the top of a rooftop in Vegas coming up with the name of the wolf pack. But, uh, but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> Yours is the deeper philosophy. On it. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess that I think the thing that sort of struck me when I had the opportunity to sort of speak to you, Connor, is that the thing that I've always been fascinated about is, you know, the rise to success, then somebody obviously you know, sliding back down that pole and then being able to climb back up it is certainly something that I think that not only I can learn from, but our listeners can understand of that sense of the adversity that you've been through and then ultimately the the climbing back up the pole of success. And it all sort of started with, I guess, the online poker scene. Can you give us a bit of a background in that sense? Yeah. So I think everybody likes the kind of fall from grace, uh, comeback story. Everybody loves to come back and, uh, inspires them because they can see themselves in your story and they kind of look at, you know, your fall from grace is their halftime story. And then they're in the locker room losing and how they can come back in their life. And if you've done it, they can do it too. But, um, yeah, I had a, we a weird, uh, kind of moment in my life where I went off to college in 2003. I went to the U university of Oklahoma and uh, I live in Dallas, Texas. And what happened was the online poker boom took off. So some of you guys that are a little bit older uh, may remember this. There was a window of time where internet, uh, traditional casino poker went on the internet and accelerated the rate of which you could play hands. And also you could get into lower buy-ins, meaning playing penny tables. 
And I just kind of put $20 in a poker site my freshman year of college and started playing for pennies and dollars and tens of dollars and ran it up to being one of the top online poker players in the world. And I did this for about eight years and I did very well doing it. And then what happened was, uh, if you look on the internet, there's a historical record of this. It was called Black Friday. I believe it was April 15th, 2011. These online poker sites were kind of hosted in a weird way. They were, I guess, on offshore islands and registered by, I think it was called like the uh, Alderney Gaming Commission. But it's one of those situations where if like government can't get their hands in it, they either figure out how to get their piece of it or they completely deregulate it and destroy it. And uh, that's kind of what happened. And there's still a lot of gray areas. There's money laundering. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But in the midst of it, those of us who are making a living doing this, you know, our lives got turned upside down literally overnight. I went to bed on that day and woke up the next day, logged on to play. And uh, there's a, uh, a post on the website said, "Department, the U.S. Department of Justice has seized full tilt poker. I was like, that's weird. I went over to Poker Stars, same thing. And so they basically shut down my entire life overnight. And it was a little bit different uh, than some poker players are used to going broke and building back and going broke and building back. But this was kind of taken from me or it was taken yeah. from me. And so it was a little bit different. And it's I had my entire identity and my entire uh, future financially tied to this income stream. And it was a very risky thing to do at a young age, which I now realize, which is why I'm a big uh, preacher of multiple streams of income for diversification and insurance. But um, essentially, the online poker sites disappeared. I made some really bad decisions. I gambled off the rest of my money and helped build Windstar Casino at the board of Oklahoma and Texas. As I tell people, that's why it's so nice. Yeah. As I gambled <laughs> off everything and I literally had to tuck tail and move home with my parents uh, not even to my bedroom. I had to move into my sister's bedroom now because mine was storage by this point. And I've been driving sports cars, diamond watches, all the life that you think, you know, watching this young life, you know, when you're young and want to have all that stuff and it's all gone. And uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in life. And I hit a very, very dark period. So I can go into this or do you want me to keep going? Or <laughs> well, no, I think, I think that, I think that it'd be interesting to understand, you know, going back and at what point did you know you were rock bottom and what point did you like people are always focused on the story of up and then down. I want to understand in the depths of the darkness of all of that, where was the, where was the turning point? What was the beacon of light that kept you going then at that point, Connor? Because again, obviously the introduction to this podcast episode dives into the factor of your success now and your complete tenacity and things. Mm -hmm. Is that just something that you had by default as, as the person that you are, or was there a particular moment that you realized that, Hey, I need to pull my shit together and let's go. Yeah. So, so like what happened after online poker was I kind of was clinging to that past identity and clinging to that past. And I lived in Dallas. There's a big casino at the border of Oklahoma, Texas. And I kind of was going on like a two or three day pattern. I drive up in the morning, play all day, stay at night, play all day, stay at night, and come back after I played all day. So I was doing that for a while and I was grasping to hang on to that old life What's and, and convincing myself delusionally in my mind that online poker was going to come back like it was in the heyday. And then after a while, you know, it just it was evident that that was not the case. And that's when all the denial and all the, I guess, you know, kind of the emotions I put off kind of hit hard. And it really did drive me into a very dark moment in my life where I actually almost took my life, which I'm a lot more open about now because I know that this helps a lot of people because I was caught in that darkness. And I think it was not that I didn't want to live. I just really didn't know how to live at that moment with the kind of situation I was in. And I had convinced myself that my past days were my best days and my future days weren't worth, were never going to catch up to where I had a past that was already lived. So uh, I'm thinking I'm this identity was I'm this world-class poker player. I have all, you know, I'm a celebrity and all this stuff like young kids going to draw their mind and it's gone. So I'm stuck in this old identity and I had convinced myself that my future days were not going to be the best. And what happened was I tried to go get a job. And at the time we were post the 08 crash and I had no track record of his, no job history. And I realized that Nobody's going to hire me. And I literally have one choice, which is basically to self-sustain myself and build a business. And it got very dark at this time. And for, two things happened. Number one, I came back to my faith. I called God back into my life and I started praying again. And number two, I came across personal education, self-development simultaneously. And I vividly remember going over one night when I was completely at rock bottom, which is when I know I was at rock bottom there. Looking back in hindsight, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I stumbled across the black and white recordings of Napoleon Hill's 17 principles of success. And it really resonated with me because I knew he was not trying to pitch me a home study course. The things he was saying, I never heard people talk like that. And it was generational knowledge and generational wisdom that if it worked thousands of years ago, it worked today and will work tomorrow. And so I don't know what happened. I just really 
you know, gravitate towards this. And I went down the kind of cliche path of rapid self-education, personal development. I started coming across the, you know, a lot of the same ones you guys do, the uh, Earl Nightingales, the Bob Proctors, Les Browns, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar's, John Maxwell's. And then I started reading a bunch of books and self-educating myself. I came across, you know, uh, Bob Proctor started helping me understand the law of vibration, law of attraction, things like this. And I got really into it where I got uh, so excited I was going to manifest my future. And then sometimes we get caught up in this and I ran out really quick and I tripped over myself because I thought I was invincible at this moment. I found this new path in life and how to manifest my future. And before I knew it, <clears throat> I was $100,000 in debt and I really wow. didn't know what I was going to do at this time. And so I had been trying to build a real estate investment company. I was trying to do what's called wholesaling houses. So and did you start I, your did you start did you start your self-educational path with that in mind or did you sort of come to that through the educational path of 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 that was there any particular moment that you were like no the 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 real estate investing side of it is going to be the way that I'm going to sort of dig myself out of the hole so to speak. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So like what basically what happened was I realized I was a very negative person at the time, obviously. I had lost control of my emotions and my thought processes. And I was already pretty negative. I think most people are going into that. And uh, I mean, go, just in general in life. And that made it worse. And when I read Think and Go Rich, it made me realize I wasn't thinking. And maybe I should start thinking. And really, that's what happened when I controlled my thinking. I became rich, which is what I tell people. But um, I was completely lost. And I was you know, always angry, always frustrated. And I realized that this was self-induced and that I was causing my own problems. And I came across you know, basic understanding, which is either my thoughts create my future or my environment, my environment creates my thinking, which has to be one. So it's either I control what happens around me by the thoughts I choose inside to, li to live by and believe. And that's going to control the house I live in, the car I live in, or the external environment controls what my future shows up at is which presidents in control, how I look, did I come from money and things like that. So I really started realizing how to uh, change my thinking. And then I, I started getting heavily into like the law of attraction and things like this, where I thought I could just like, you know, manifest everything. And this is, I think, where people stumble across this in the beginning. They, they jump on it too much. But during my education process, when I was reading a bunch of books and podcasts, I read um, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, one of the cliche books. And I really understood a couple, I, I, I came across a couple other books that led to residual income. And I realized I had been living my life incorrectly because as a poker player, I had one income stream and I did everything on my own. It was tied to my time. It was tied to my emotions. And I realized that I don't have to build a business this way. I could insure myself and have more than one income stream. I could build a business that's not tied to my own energy, my own efforts, my own emotion patterns, and I could have employees or teams, and then I could work for residual income and build equity. And so what I realized was that real estate was going to be a great vehicle for this, and I wanted to get in and start buying rental properties. But the problem was I wasn't financeable at the time, and I didn't have that much working capital, so I couldn't control properties. So my goal was to get in and start doing wholesaling, wholesaling houses to build up some working capital then transition into keeping properties. And I kind of did that in a way, but I had flipping houses in the middle. I started wholesaling. That led me to flipping houses. And then I built my rental portfolio. Then I realized it wasn't as much cash flow as I wanted. So I um, I got caught where I was running out of working capital in my business. So I started selling some of these houses on owner financing, which brought the down payment money in, which gave me some, yep. some money to run my business and pay my bills. It maintained that cash flow position in the middle because now I'm uh, now a lender, not a, a landlord. And then it avoided me a lot of back end expenses as far as repairs. Like, so that's the HVAC goes out. I'm not the landlord now, I'm the lender. But uh, ultimately, I think it was uh, kind of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a couple of real estate books in the beginning that really impressed upon me the term passive income, which I, shocking uh, to some of you guys, I was like mid to late 20s. It never come across my thought process. And it was because I was so entrenched in the poker world. That's all I knew and that's all I saw. So it was a completely yeah. foreign concept to me. And, and the fact that I could trade my efforts once and get paid over and over and over on it really resonated with me as compared to I could trade my time today and actually lose everything I came into the table, <laughs> sat down at the table <laughs> uh, with. It just seemed a lot like a lot better path. But um, that's really what gravitated me towards the industry of real estate was the ability to potentially create cash flow and uh, have my time and money freedom. I want to go, I want to dive into obviously where, where we go into the YouTube side of things and the investment and then back into now, now as an agent. But before I get there, there's something that you said before is that that manifesting, um, it's just something that we hear so, so much of at the moment is that it seems to be that that is the new hype cycle in things. I know that it's been around for a very long time, but I find that people are, I don't know, manifesting out of delusion. 
I, I like yeah. like I, I'm not sure, but can you give us your thoughts on that? Because it's something that obviously <laughs> you've been through and you've done plenty of learning through, and you probably speak to your team about and so on and so forth. But but again, I just I find that it's it could be toxic in a lot of environments. It can, and it's dangerous, and that's actually what happened to me early on in my life. So I, my mom at one point had given me the the I forget it was the book or the movie of uh, what's it called, The Secret. And in there, you hear in all the stories of Jim Carrey and all these things, you know, like sitting there, you know, reading and holding a check in his, and, you know, people just believing it's going to happen. And I tell people, you're not just going to sit in a room and think about what you want and just say, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. It's not going to just show up. It's the thought process that we focus on followed by the energy over time that creates what would people would call manifestation or the physical showing up in the real world that we have. Because we have an internal world that's controlled by our thoughts and an external world that's the physical world. And the bridge between these is our sensory uh, tools, you know, our thought, our touch, taste, sound, feel, things like that. So um, I just kind of got into, so basically um, I went down a process where I came across uh, Bob Proctor, the law of vibration, which really kind of helped me understand this. And if you guys haven't gone down that process, I would look into Bob Proctor's too long to go off into a tangent, but ultimately what we, we can't have anything in life that we don't see in the mind first or think about first. So the first thing is you have to see it in the mind. We go from an intellectual process to an emotional process to a physical process. So if I was going to paint something like this wolf logo on the wall behind me, it could, not act, it could absolutely not show up on the wall behind me unless I intellectually had it in the mind first, meaning I could see it in the mind. You can't paint a painting unless you see it in the mind. You can't build a business unless you see it in the mind. So you can't want a Lamborghini unless you know what a Lamborghini is. So if you go to the jungle into a, you know, a third world nation where they've never seen a Lamborghini, they won't know to want one because it's not intellectually understood in the mind. So now that you show them a picture of it, show them what it can do, they're going to go, whoa. That's pretty cool. Now this opens up the intellectual side of things. Once you have it in the mind, you could possibly have an emotional involvement in it. Do you just kind of want that Lamborghini or are you willing to sacrifice everything to go get that Lamborghini? So now that we have intellectual understandings, we have the ability to emotionally tie ourselves into something. If the emotions are high enough into what we want, we'll push past the moment where we take a risk. And if we take the necessary risk and follow it up and do the right things through repetition over time, eventually the results come. But um, ultimately, I think people just think they can think about stuff and it shows up. You have to put the time in and it takes a lot longer than people think. So they see my outcome here. It didn't happen quick. I worked uh, 1,100 days without a day off. And I guess that's a flex now, but it wasn't when I did it. It was out of fear. And I was going backwards and I was running out of money and I had no money. And it was just like someone threw me off a cruise ship. You just... You're not swimming to be cool. You're swimming to survive. And um, and so I think young entrepreneurs don't understand the sacrifice that you pay on the front side to build the skill sets and the strengths and the understanding and the awareness of uh, business to hold up a strong business tomorrow. And uh, you see people hop in six, 12 months, they quit. I mean, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. I spent 1,100 days of my life to break even. When I finally got even, a partner stole 30 grand from me or something. It was like 30, 35 grand. I went right back into debt. So it was over three years before I finally almost going into four years before I even broke even with my business. Yep. Now I have a seven figure income, but if I had not gone through that, um, horrific window of my time and every day you're doubting yourself, you're doubting your path, you're doubting your choices, you're, you're regretting it. And, and I got to a point where I really doubted that it was even possible for someone like myself who came from a middle-class family with no, no gifts, no specialties, no, you know, trust fund baby. Like, is it even possible to actually build a successful business? And I want you guys yeah. to know that you don't have to come from money. You don't have to have that background that you, you can have anything you want in life, but you have to educate yourself on the skill sets to get it. And you have to build the mindset in the self image within yourself that you can stay, stay with it until it works. And I think a lot of people are so focused on skill sets and not mindset in the beginning, because the most important thing that builds anything in life is our self image and our self respect for ourselves. When we believe in ourselves, we're confident that we can achieve things. And that's when we take risks. So you could have a strong vehicle, meaning the compensation model, whatever you're trying to sell or do. But if it, this gets tough and the mindset's broken, you sit down. So the first thing is I realized I had to develop self-esteem in myself. So I, I went out there, I was way overweight and I got jacked and I got into the gym. I started lifting weights. And what this did was it changed my physical body, which showed progression. And it also made me start feeling better about myself. And when we look good and we feel good, this is when we're in our best mind. And then I said, well, if I change my physical body, I could change my mind too. And so then I started, you know, going down the path of self-development. So I was building my mind and building my body. And once you build both these, you can build a business is what I tell people. But um, 
yeah, and I'm going off on a little bit here, but uh, no, 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 I, no, I, no, I, I, I but I love, I love the, I love the progression of it all. I love, the, I love the progression of it all because I think that you know it, it gives people an understanding of what you went through, but it also gives them an understanding of an actual process in order to to actually visualize things. You have to visualize in order, order for it to come come to reality. Obviously, like you said and gave the example of the wolf, did you visualize? the success that you have on one of the avenues that you've been incredibly successful on is the YouTube side of it and that investor element side. Did you have that vision? Um, the YouTube stuff a little bit, not so much what I'm doing with the EXP team, not at all actually. Um, and this is an important concept. So like talking about manifesting. Um, so I want you guys to understand it's not going to happen on your time schedule, even though we can put time constraints behind our goals. But what you need to understand is what you want as an outcome. So all you need to know is the outcome, just like if you're driving to a destination, what do you need? You need the starting point, you need the ending destination, and you put that in your GPS and the, everything fills its way or all the directions come in the middle. Okay. So I knew what I wanted to have as far as an outcome in life financially. I knew I wanted a residual income. I knew I wanted this type of house, this type of car, this type of family, and all these different things. Now, I did not know how I was going to get there along the way, but in the beginning, I thought that I was going to do it through insurance. I actually went into insurance before real estate. That wasn't the way that it worked out. Then I went into the investment side of the business, and I thought that that was going to be the way that I was going to get there. But ultimately, what happened is I got there through getting my real estate license and building a team later. And the reason why that happened is because as you're moving forward on this journey, doors open doors. And so it's very common you hear people say they their third or fourth business was the one that took off. The skill sets you learn from failing on the first one and then the adversity that you uh, come across, you're building yourself up so that later in life you failed at enough things that you can spot opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise. And I had gone to a company called WFG, which is where Ed Milet's from, and I watched the power of team building at that company. I just really didn't like the insurance space. But I'd always told myself that if I ever came across an opportunity at the bottom floor of a company that's built with like an override model network marketing type of system and I could get in at the bottom and it was a long-term business model that was not a fly by night, like product or service, but like real estate's kind of like a lifelong business. And I, and I saw that the company was strong. I was just going to get in and kind of run for it. So I had, I had felt like I missed an opportunity early on in my life and that I was always having the awareness that if an opportunity like this came up, came out at the right time, I would seize it. But in the midst of it, I was really just focusing on building my investment business. And the way that EXP came across my plate was I built uh, one of the larger YouTube channels in North America called Investor Army for the investing space. And P EXP started taking off and people started reaching out to me because I was in real estate, but I wasn't an agent. I was an investor. I was focusing on my goals, going the right direction for my investment business. And I was speaking at a real estate uh, conference on creative financing. So it had nothing to do with the real estate sales business. And uh, the number one guy at our company here at EXP, as far as the largest team uh, leader, was speaking at that same event. So I kind of got stuck into a speaker's house with them. So at these events, if you've ever kind of been on the circuit, you know, sometimes they get like speaker properties or Airbnbs. So I was able to stay for three or four days with this individual. Now, up until this point, I'd really kind of been blowing EXP off for like a couple of years, just to be honest. And uh, I wasn't licensed at the moment. And nobody had told me that I could build a large residual income stream with my real estate license. I thought you could just right. sell houses for commission. And he started yep. telling me about how he's making over six figures a month in residual income. And it was literally just like the Wolf of Wall Street, where I was like, you proved to me you make 72K a month. I quit my job. I work for you. I was like, Rob, if you can prove <laughs> to me that in just a few years, you've been able to use your real estate license and this team building model to create a six-figure net residual income monthly, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to go get my license. I'm going to travel around the country, and I'm going to build this with you. And uh, this was a little over five years ago, and that's pretty much what happened in my mind. Or there's a little caveat here, but um, that's pretty much what happened. But uh, this is important as well. I sometimes tell this part, sometimes not. But what happened was I was convinced that I was going to do this. I sold myself on the opportunity. And in sales, we bring temperatures lo temperature levels up. We take people from disinterested to level of interest. But if you don't keep that focus on what your product is or your service or opportunity you're selling, that temperature level can drop. And what happened was I was 100% uh, convicted that I was going to get my license and come back and build this. And when I got back, life kind of kicked heavy in the face. I had some big fires I had to put out. I had contractors stealing from me. And before I knew it, a week had gone by, then two, then three, and then four. And my basic uh, interest had started dropping. It was out of my focus. Right. This is why follow-up is incredibly right. important. And to kind of give you, when we talk about did I know, I didn't know up until this moment, but this was the moment I really knew. So what happened was I had to speak at another events, investment conference on the complete other side of, of the country. So I was in Mississippi. Now I'm speaking in Tucson, Arizona. 
I believe it was. And uh, there was four or five speakers at this event. And guess who was speaking at this event too? It was Rob Flick. And he was uh, randomly, there's randomly there. And so twice in, within a month, I never met this person, didn't know, you know, have any relationship. And then two different events within a month, we we're speaking at the same event with a small speakers list. And that's really when I kind of knew immediately that, you know, I kind of looked up. I remember being like, okay, I hear you. You beat me in the face with this. And that's, I actually booked my um, real estate school at that, at that event. And I got back the next day or a day later, Monday morning, and I knocked out my real estate license as fast as the state of Texas would allow me to do it. I think it was about five weeks start to finish before I got my license. And this was going into like October or November-ish of 2017. And I was fully on board at EXP okay. a couple of days before 2018 started. And here we are now. I've been able to actually build a larger residual income than when I met Rob. And so the the seeing that happen or having the credibility proven that this is done created a vision within me, which is also why it's good that you guys are following podcasts like this. You can find your story and your vision within our stories. And um, that's kind of just, you know, it all just kind of full like, circle. Yeah, it's uh, kind of crazy when you think about it, but that's how it played out. <laughs> so, so, so a question a lot of agents that are listening right now would be thinking, hang on a second, if I'm an investor and I'm flipping homes and I'm doing all of that stuff, I do not want to get into real estate. I'm in real estate at the moment and I'd rather get into flipping and investing and doing all of that. What was the what was the change in it all? Like 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 do you do do you like the unemotional element of of the flipping element? Or maybe there is more to it that it's involved for you, but or the real estate side of it of recruiting agents and retaining agents because you're essentially recruiting and retaining agents and building those people in order to be to get benefit of the of the the tiered model that there is at EXP is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so we have a seven tier override model. So uh, my main goal was to build residual income. Now, in the process of doing so, especially on the investment side, you need working capital. You need to be able to leave money into properties. So I was fl flipping houses at the time to create active income. And uh, I was making much better checks flipping houses than I could have, in my mind, selling real estate. And it never occurred to me that I wanted to represent buyers and sellers. I always just wanted to kind of stay behind the scenes and run my own business. But what happened was I didn't know you could build a residual income stream with your license. And this was the first time I came across this. And there had been many points throughout my career, just like a lot of investors, you guys have probably felt this where on and off, you've had an urge to go get your license. It's like, let's say you're, I remember specifically this one lady from Arkansas had like an almost $600,000 property. She didn't, I had, ex, I was going back and forth of her trying to explain the difference between an investor and an agent, but that's, you know, a 15, $18,000 check. And so there's, but by the time I'd get my license, it'd be, that deal would be gone. So you have to have it ahead of time before those leads come in. And so I'd already almost done this a few times, but it just didn't make sense. But then when I realized that I could build the residual income through the revenue share model, the reason why this gravitated, I gravitated to, to it and why I wanted to do this was because of the leverage of it. So building a rental portfolio is a linear progression, meaning same time, same effort, same financing process, same tenant, one by one by one, you add them one by one by one. But the way that the revenue share model works is it's leveraged. So agents can go attract agents. So if you think about it, a capping agent creates almost the cash flow that if you sponsor them through EXP as what a rental property creates. But this rental property right. doesn't grow legs and pop arms out and walk down the street and start attracting rental properties into the portfolio. Whereas if you bring in right. quality partners and good friends that want to share in the journey with you, they'll go out there and start recruiting agents. So I saw it as a, as a leveraged model to build cash flow where I need a license anyways. So this kind of put me past that hump where I can now attract agents that can go attract agents. And then also what I realized later is a lot of these agents come across deals in the marketplace that bring houses for me to buy back for my investment business. So I saw it as houses that can find houses that can find houses in a weird way. And then the other thing is I think a lot of agents work at single income stream transactional businesses. They don't have an equity model and they don't have a residual income model to it. And if you draw like both sides of the business, let's say you're an investor and an agent on a T-chart. <clears throat> so on this side you have, and on both sides, you put all three income streams in business. We have active income, we have equity models, and we have residual income. So if you think about most agents that I get a flat fee shop, they can create active income with their license, but then they don't have equity, don't, don't have cash flow. But if they're an investor, this is why they become an investor because they have active income through like wholesaling and flipping houses. Then they have the equity mm -hmm. ownership position from the ownership of real estate. And then they have the residual income from if they do notes, rentals, or passive money lending. And then when I saw the EXP model had 
the stock awards and the revenue share model, what I, what it did for me is I realized that this fills in on both sides of my business. I have all three ways of creating income and it's going to allow me to get super aggressive on my marketing because no matter what lead comes in the office, whether it has equity in it or has no equity in it, or whether it's a low price point or high price point, I can now maximize and have the highest and best use of that exit strategy. And so it, it really let me realize this is the first time someone can really be a full 360 degree real estate professional in the industry because Traditionally, the brokerage space, in my opinion, lost some of the opportunities that entrepreneurship gives us, which is wealth creation, which comes from equity models and cash flow models. But that uh, gravitated so me to that. To that's that. part of the question. That's part of the question here, though. Like, I understand that I understand the residual side of things in the sense that you can find agents to then go recruit other agents and then build your network and then build off them. But I've only ever seen companies burn people when it comes to the stock side of things. Like, Compass is a beautiful example of that. Yep. Um, so, so there's and and the other element of things that is is just hyper confusing to all of this is the fact that all of these publicly traded companies are adjusted EBITDA profit or their cash flow profit or things along those lines where at the end of the day they're they're building a model where it ultimately doesn't need to make any money so where is the i guess entrepreneurship in the sense of ownership in any of that yeah so i'm not really a stock guy so i'm not 100 percent sure how all that works i just know that they so we don't give it options we actually have stock awards um, sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure on how, I like, guess that's not my focus. When I came over here, uh, the stock was a cherry on top, but what I can tell yeah, you is it. it's, okay. it's been a, it's been a big cherry and it was an unexpected sure. cherry, but that was truly not the reason I came over here. Um, it was just kind of an unexpected, uh, benefit from, from doing so now for certain agents that are production agents, we have more powerful stock awards like our icon program, which is the entire company cap they give that they have given back to them. Um, sure, sure. now it was really, it was really the growth model that attracted me to EXP. And then also the fact that I had a YouTube channel that already had a couple of tens of thousands of followers that had a digital or had a large footprint and that they were going to let me build in multiple markets. And then the last thing that gravitated me was that at EXP, you, they have the broker rooms run by licensed state brokers and associate brokers, and then all the accounting and processing and everything's done by the company employees. And they already had all the back end management system done. So we're, they're not asking you to be a broker and sit in an office and run, you know, they really want you to be kind of the front end, uh, you know, recruiting team or sales team that brings in the talent and then works with them. So we get to work on the fun stuff, you know, working with our partners. So can you deals. give me an idea? Can you give me an idea of what that looks like though? Like, like you bring somebody in and then what, what's your process in the sense of like bringing them in and then how do you coach them through the recruitment of other agents whilst also, because those people need to do deals. Because is there two types of people that you're recruiting? You're recruiting people into your business that then are recruiting others. And then you're recruiting people into the business that then are doing deals as well, correct? Correct. So I'd say there's three different types of agents that would possibly come to a company like EXP. Um, one is just sales only, and that's only what they want to do. All they're going to do is sell real estate, which is hundred percent fine. That's a great goal. Then there's some that come from more of the entrepreneurship perspective, which you would think of more of like a broker, which is all they want to do is run the team. They're no longer in personal production. They're not out there working deals. They're just going to be building the business. And then the biggest split, probably 80 or 90% share some distribution of their time doing both, whether, you know, just like an investor. You're going to flip some houses, but you're going to keep some houses, but you're doing both. So active to passive, active to pass on both sides. Um, so when it's when we're partnering with people, it is up to them what their goals are. So I'm not their broker. I'm not their boss. I'm their partner, hopefully their friend. And it's my job to po point them in the right direction to the resources, training systems, and things that we, we've created that are going to help them get to the goal that they want to go to. So if someone wants to come in and, and, and build a team, I'm not going to push them to go sell real estate. And then if somebody wants to come right. in and wants to sell houses, I'm not going to say, hey, go recruit agents. That is their individual goal to decide what they want to do. Now, if they want to build a team, if you want to build one of the size of the, like the organization I did, there's kind of three levels that you kind of have to master. The first step is your own ability to build the business yourself through personal agent attraction. You're your own individual starting point. If you can't personally attract agents, your business doesn't get off the ground. So I went out there and I, in the first six months, I recruited probably, uh, I think it was 36 people, give or take a few. And, uh, but my team had grown to 51. So we have a seven tier override model, which means those first tier agents I brought in can attract agents. And if they come in, they're on tier two. Then if I have agents on my second tier and they want to build a business and they attract agents, they come on tier three. And that happens on a seven tier schedule. So as I had these agents come in, 
what I had to do was realize that they're not out there recruiting agents because they don't have either the motivation to do so, the understanding, or something's broken. So I started realizing step two is to take the agents I recruited to train them on how to recruit agents themselves. So I learned how to recruit myself. Then I learned how to teach people how to recruit, which is your leadership skill sets being built. And then level three that gives you your freedom so you can step out from the business is now that agents, now that you've taught yourself how to recruit agents and then taught people how to recruit agents themselves. Now you need to teach those people that were teaching agents how to recruit, teaching them how to teach how to recruit. It creates a leadership kind of perspective. So now we're training them to be leaders. And what happens is yep. you start to develop leadership teams and they build individual businesses inside your organization. And so I kind of uh, work directly with my close mentor or uh, partners. I mentor them one-on-one. -on -one. And then I run different leadership calls with leadership groups where we do small form Zoom conversations. And then I run the mass organization through larger mastermind calls, which is going to have the entire variety of partners that we have coming in all the way from brand new agents up to the most seasoned agents in the industry. But, um, yep. and, and really that's kind of how you're going to build any business. That's it. You know, it's an interesting, it's, it's interesting to understand it because most people get into real estate to sell real estate versus grow and build that team element. So that th let's say that somebody's sitting here at the moment and they're like, well, how do I recruit 36 people onto, you know, even if they're outside of the XP model, what do they do in order to build their own individual team in that first degree? They've obviously got to understand their own value proposition um, and how they're going to attract that talent. How ultimately did you have those first 36 conversations that built that in the first month for you? Where did you find them? Was it from your YouTube channel, from the investor side of it? H how did it all work? Uh, yes and no. Some did and some didn't. So the first thing is, you know, you've probably heard of like a, a warm and cold list in business, those terms. I kind of separate and train the agents on hot warm and cold lists. So traditionally a warm and cold list would be warm market leads or traditional pre-existing relationships and cold market leads are unknown relationships where I create three lists to go after. And you can do this for most businesses where a hot list would be your pre-existing relationship database. A warm list is going to be referral network mark, uh, like the, the, the referral network, meaning I'm an investor. I know title companies. I know mortgage brokers. I have a mom. I have a sister. People know people. Then people know people. Enough people have licenses out of a hundred. So now you're getting yep. the warm handoff. And a lot of my good partners and best partners came from personal relationships where I knew someone from this business that also knew this person and they were connecting through a warm handoff. So the first thing I did was I came in and I, uh, aggressively studied the model and I aggressively studied anything I could on people that had built the model ahead of time. So I needed to get some skill sets right. because in understanding, and this is important if you're in sales of any type, you will unconsciously self-sabotage yourself if you don't have a full understanding of what you're selling because you don't want to have the questions that you don't have the answer for. So therefore you avoid, avoid to get in the conversation. So if you guys are not doing well in sales, aggressively study what you have to sell because the more you know, the more you're going to grow. We say the more likely you are to get in that conversation. So I aggressively studied them all in the beginning and I watched all the top leaders in my company and I watched all their presentations and I kind of created my Frankenstein model, meaning I grabbed an arm from John, I grabbed a, a, a foot from Susan, meaning I liked how they explained the stock. I liked how, and I kind of created my own swing. And then I went out to all my pre-existing relationships of anybody that I knew that had licenses up until this moment, which was not a lot. And then I also went to a lot of investors. I knew that if I knew if I would go get my license, they might do so as well. So I kind of went through my warm market and I was doing this simultaneously while I was uh, working leads. I started posting videos on social media and I had reactive leads coming in. So there's two different approaches where you can spend your time, proactive and reactive. And for example, let's just use social media because we're on it. Proactive would be where I'm going on Facebook or I'm going on Instagram and I'm looking for agents to reach out to. I'm proactively looking to get into conversations. I'm reaching out to John through Facebook. Now, reactive is taking that same time and putting content out and letting them react to you. And so I was putting videos on the internet, and then I was also doing proactive strategies, reaching out to people in my local market. And then at the same time, what I was doing was I was going to local networking events to develop coal market leads and, and meet people face-to-face. -face. And so I was going to three to five networking events a week. These could be um, real estate investment events. Like for one, I brought in my second largest partner. His name is Brant Phillips. He's an incredible entrepreneur. He's written a couple of books out there. I met him at a IRA, an IRA custodial event on ten, teaching people how to self-direct their IRAs to get into investments. So this is where I think people understand that people know people and people are everywhere and people in business get out there and network. And I didn't go there. I went there to learn for that topic, but on the IRA, yeah. we were learning IRAs, but it led me to a conversation 
to lead me to a partner of mine that we now have about 400 agents combined. But the point is build your network, get out and meet people, and then uh, they can connect you to others and you'd be surprised who you actually meet because he had been sitting on his real estate license and it was it was either inactive or he just wasn't doing anything with it. And he was an investor just like myself, but he had a huge network and I was able to get in the conversation and help him understand. So I was going to a lot of networking events. And then what I was doing was I was work, uh, just pretty much calling any agent in my local market. When I come across their signs, I was flipping a bunch of houses and let's say I'd go into a neighborhood and you know, you had a sign two doors down. I'd reach out to you and say, Hey, you want to grab lunch? I see you put the house on the market. What's going on in the marketplace? I don't know if I'm going to list this myself. Or I'm gonna have, and I just started developing conversations like that. But um, that's kind of how I got so most of my so, original lead. Yeah, that's so, sort of how you've got most of it there. I, I guess that to sort of round out all of this is that what is the vision for the future? I guess where 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 does this take you and where do you go to next to sort of put yeah. a cherry on top of this, Connor? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And we, and like when you, if you come partner with us, partner with us, we, we train you guys on over 20 different ways to start these conversations. But, um, the goal with this right now is to take it to 10,000 agents, uh, globally and to be in every marketplace that eXp gives us the ability to operate in. So currently right now we have Wolfpack agents in all 50 States, every Canadian province, and I believe 14 of the 20 or so countries we can operate in. And part of the reason why I'm now getting out here and doing more podcasts is to kind of get a larger footprint. Y'all can actually partner with us if you come across this podcast, even if you live in a different nation. My number one partner lives in Canada. I live in Texas and we built a global business together where we have, you know, a few thousand agents together. So um, it, it really is just depending on, you know, what you're trying to accomplish in your life. And uh, But geographical restriction does not matter anymore. But uh, my big goal right. is 10,000. And then what I'd like to do after that is uh, go into certain things like venture capitalism and finding young entrepreneurs where because of the nature on how I built this business, I've been able to spot people where they're at in the progressive and the, and the journey that they're progressing on. So I could kind of see like a video game. Oh, John's on level seven. Susan's on level three. Like you kind of get a feel for this. And so I can see people in their, in their ascent. And I can also see the big leaks in their business where they're making these mistakes and I can come in and I can plug these holes and I can mentor them and I can also invest behind them. So that's going to be my long-term goal um, just because it's something I've always thought about doing and want to do. And then along the way, I'm going to just acquire, uh, continue acquiring as many doors as I can. Uh, and it may not just be into like apartments or single family. It could possibly be storage units, mobile home parks, possibly RV parks. But for the short term, it is 100% uh, all hands on deck during this window of time to build EXP out. And then along the side, and so I still do a lot of investing, uh, but mostly I'm not flipping houses to sell. I'm flipping them to keep as long-term properties is kind of what's going on. Right. And then- um, Any particular any particular marketplaces that you focus at at the moment for uh, the flipping yeah. and long-term hold? So for all my long-term hold properties, they're here in a, in a, a North Texas market called Grayson County. Uh, I invest about an hour north of DFW. And there's a lake that's being built northeast of Dallas in the DFW Metroplex called, I think it's the Boys D'Arc Reservoir. And when you think about it, what's the most valuable property? Waterfront property, ocean, Water, you know, yeah. uh, rivers, oceans, lakes, and they don't create, you know, rivers, oceans, lakes very often. So they're building one of the largest man-made lakes. And this is where I'm going to put a big effort up there. And so what happened was I started investing in this area because I had to a long time ago, I couldn't compete against the major companies in DFW. They were kind of whooping me uh, just straight up. They were, they were uh, about to put me out of business. And so <clears throat> what I did was I moved out to secondary and tertiary markets. And so if you guys are struggling in your primary market, I started moving out like a dartboard away from my main market. And as you get into some of these satellite cities, there's less competition. Properties are a little bit lower. And I started buying mobile homes on land. And, uh, I was buying them for like 10 or $15,000. And now here a decade later, some of these are worth a hundred, $125,000. But what happened was I had some of the people living in my mobile homes tell me that this big lake was coming in and they were driving the bulldozers for it. So I've been acquiring properties up here in the, in front of the path of progression, knowing this would happen. So if you guys want to create wealth, I learned this early on. I had a, when I was younger, I had a kid on my baseball team whose dad made millions of dollars. He was a, a doctor. He bought and I'll never forget this. So listen to the lessons you've learned along the way, including this podcast, because this is what made me millions, is he he bought a land piece of property quite a bit north of Dallas and then in front of the path of development. And he held it for about 10 years and then he sold it for, I think it was eight figures or something like that. And he told me, he explained to me, and I was young and it didn't make sense, but later in my life, I remembered exactly what he did and I knew he made this big profit. So I understood 
find where people are moving to because people have money and that money's coming too. And if you get ahead of this wave at the bottom floor of it, you get to reap the rewards of being at the bottom floor of that market growth. So I, uh, that's pretty much what I did. I started buying out here in these secondary and tertiary, tertiary markets that are now starting to grow a little bit bigger. But, um, that, well, it's that's, been a, well, it's been a complete yeah, it's been a complete roller coaster ride for you from online poker and to investing to real estate to you know continuing to do that to have the vision of ten thousand plus agents and then I love the idea of the venture capital side of things. If you've got a real estate mindset, then obviously then that'll probably be some of it will be in the real estate space as well and try and evolve and and do that. It's been an incredible journey so far, Connor, and we appreciate you sharing it with us on Rethink Real Estate. Thanks for joining. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on here. And uh, yeah, just let you guys leave you with this. It, you know, just you're going to get bored eventually, even if you build a successful business. So you're not going to just stay in the same path, but you're always going to kind of stay in that same alignment somewhat. Like real estate is kind of like a lifelong business, but you can venture into different areas, but build a strong foundation first. You know, gets, you know, have something that generates capital and build a decent residual income before you start taking risks. And then, you know, play with as much risk money as you want. So kind of get to like a, a safe foundation level, meaning for some of you guys, it could be half a million dollars, a million dollars, and then start taking high risk gambles. And just know it's like drilling oil holes. You're probably gonna go blank, 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 but then you hit one and it, and it can really take off. So I took too many risks in the beginning, uh, with liability based businesses. And, uh, that's how I went into debt. So if I could start over, I would have gone into something that had sales based off where I'm building it with my work ethic, not my bank account and not borrowing money to go backwards. Cause that was probably the biggest mistake I had in the beginning was, uh, trying to grow a business that had a, a net, ne- net negative expense that goes backwards. But, um, ultimately, you know, you, you, once you learn the skill sets to win in one business, you can put them into any business and, uh, and you just chase your goals along as, as along the journey as they come across it. But, um, just know that the door you went through today is not the one that you're probably going to end up in. And just know that along the journey to keep an eye out for the right people that come into your life and the right opportunities. And, uh, you'll know what's right when it's right. Absolutely. Final question for you. Just curious. Do you still play poker? <laughs> uh, I do not as much as I want to. So the problem is like, it's such a net negative on my time because I couldn't guarantee the return, return on my time now. And poker is more of a hobby now if I want to do it. And then it's kind of like I had such a traumatic emotional, uh, like it was pretty bad. Like I remember I like almost made me it, think it's attached life. to negative memories. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, 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 I yeah. still do it, but like we have our big conferences at like EXP con in Vegas. I don't go play every now and then I go do, but the problem is if I go play once, I want to play again and then again, and then again, and before I know it, I'm tied up into something that's distracting me. And, um, I played enough poker in my life. I know it, it would only be if I'm having fun doing it. And the problem is if I'm sitting there all day, I have it, uh, I feel like I'm letting the ball down, supporting my partners and doing things like that. So I try to not play. Um, but I still enjoy it every now and then I just don't really that much, um, at all anymore, maybe a few times a year. Well, again, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, man. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, anything I can do for you guys, just let me know. You can probably find me on Instagram. Check out any of my YouTube channels. And uh, if you're interested in we'll having- have all, we'll, have everything, we'll have everything in the show notes for people to follow you indeed. Okay, cool, cool. Awesome. Thanks so much, Connor. Yes, sir. Hope you guys had a great day and, and learned something. And I uh, wish you guys the best. And don't ever stop. Just keep going and you'll get there. So about 75% of our audience hasn't liked, followed, or subscribed to our podcast. It would mean the world to us and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow, or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.